What's up, everybody? Grant Wise here. Welcome to the Marketing Genius Podcast. I am pumped, honored, grateful for our guests here today. I was walking down the street to go get lunch the other day, and I happened to run into a great, good old friend, Mr. Seth White. Uh, he's a, an attorney here locally. I grew up with Seth. I travel a lot with Seth, live sometimes, it seemed like, with Seth. Uh, we played a lot of baseball together growing up and uh, still are great friends and uh, spend a lot of time with their family. And uh, we got to talking about uh, business and, and, and different types of things. And I became really fascinated with having a great conversation with Seth about kind of the art of negotiation and how attorneys use different types of uh, tactics or, or, or strategies as I, I wanted to give you guys an outsider's perspective. Maybe some, you could grab something from a different industry that might apply to you that will help you when you, maybe you're negotiating your next contract or you're negotiating with a seller or whatever that might look like for you. So I invited Seth to come on the podcast. He said, I'll come on yours if you come on mine. And so uh, this part of the conversation, uh, I'm interviewing him and I'm pumped to just have a, a great conversation. So Seth, thanks for stopping by the show today, bro. Yeah, of course, man. I know you're a busy guy, so it, it, it means a lot you took the time and uh, I'm, I'm pumped for everybody to kind of get to know you a little bit. So um, I'll let you just kind of give the backstory, man. How did you get to where you are today? You're, you're currently an attorney, but kind of what was the path for you to get there? Oh, gosh. Um, well, that's a crazy long story, but uh, uh, like you said, I've known you forever, man. Uh, so it's, it's good to be on here. Uh, makes me feel old that we're talking about these types of topics instead of baseball and that, that type of thing. But uh, I mean, generally, I always I played baseball through college, all that stuff. Um, that was really important to me. And I just had a drive for doing something that was competitive, uh, something that always challenged me. Uh, and it's something where I was interacting and relating to people because that's probably my best skill set uh and so uh you know i guess sometime you know even as young as high school i realized that you know law and then specifically trial law uh and, and that practice uh was something i could do well uh and be good at um, and then it just kind of steamrolled down and i you know i spent some time working for insurance companies in little rock and and defending insurance companies and then got a chance to move back home to Northwest Arkansas and, uh, you know, work directly with people, uh, uh, on different types of usually, you know, personal injury claims, but, uh, in any kind of insurance claim, anything that needs to be disputed in the civil arena, uh, you know, and I'm raw, And that's why I think maybe you asked me while we got on that topic, because it's always for me, uh, negotiating, uh, a number, uh, and typically we only try, you know, uh, gosh, maybe one to two percent of the cases. So it's always how do I get this person to the right number? How do they think this is the right number when a lot of the time uh, we're just kind of in the dark because no one really tries cases anymore? Love it. Yeah, that was we were you were uh, we were just talking kind of like talking about some generalized topics. And I, I kind of dove into the negotiation side of it because you you brought up this specific tactic. I was like, well, what on earth made you think to do that? And I was like, there's probably all kinds of stuff that you do that, uh, you know, from, from an agent's perspective, right? You're always kind of trying to do the same thing. You're trying to negotiate to a specific number to win for your clients. And sometimes that means you're negotiating direct between buyers and sellers, or sometimes that means you're negotiating directly with an agent who's also trying to get the best deal for their client. And it's, um, you know, it, it seems like the two lines or the two industries kind of cross in, in, in some ways when it comes to negotiation. So whenever you guys or whenever you, and you don't have to tell specific stories and you can't really do that, but whenever you guys are, are negotiating, um, you know, what is it that you like, obviously the, the end result is getting your client the best deal. But what do you feel goes into that from maybe a psychological standpoint when you start negotiating or uh, different bluffs that you have? Like what types of things play into negotiating and getting somebody the right number? So one thing I do a lot um, is I do focus groups um, and you don't have to do formal focus groups. I mean, you can, I quote focus group cases with friends, family, people at a restaurant, uh, strangers in an elevator 
because I think sometimes, at least in my field, I don't know if you guys do it, there's just become an industry standard. Well, okay, this is worth this much because of X, Y, Z. Uh, here's the deal. You know, this is a, sim you know, they'll say, well, this is a, you know, a, a simple case. This is a fact pattern. We've seen it, you know, a hundred times. This is what it's worth. This is what everyone says it's worth. And you can do that and that's fine. Uh, but what I, what I do with like the focus groups and talking to just what I would call lay people, people who aren't in my profession, is you can get their perspective and it can add value to your case. Or it can tell you, I need to get this thing settled because I'm already way above where I should be. But so like if you can, if you can consciously be talking to people about, okay, you know, and, and asking him, okay, what is something worth, but what would make it worth more? You know, if, if I did this, uh, would you pay more for it or would you pay less or do you pay less because of this? And then so you kind of get these lay people's perspective and then you can use that. Uh, like if I have a big focus group, I'll have a video and I'll play clips for, you know, the, the other party or whatever. But you can use that information to get new ideas to get outside of the industry norm and say, okay, yeah, you say it's this type of case, but it's got this. And you know it's going to hit because it's something that like three, four, five lay people have said is important to them or would change them because you can you can just hit whoever you're talking with. Well, mine's a little different, and here's why you need to pay a little more or something like that, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. So in real estate, right, uh, maybe an agent, if you're listening to this, you know, when Seth's talking about focus groups, um, it, it sounds really similar to maybe a CMA or a comparative market analysis, right? So most agents are, are extremely familiar with what that is, right? You, you find a house, you go run a CMA to see what other houses around it um, or similar to it are selling for. And then when you're talking about, um, <clears throat> you know, what's going to help me get more out of the specific situation, there's all types of conversations that agents have direct to consumer, like, you know, house improvements or uh, vicinity improvements or whatever those different types of things are. So, uh, and it's interesting. I, I was, I was really fascinated with how you came to the conclusion and you can, you can tell us if you want, how you came to the conclusion on like how to even go towards using focus groups. Like what, what made your mind go there, right? In the, in, the, in the real estate industry, it's kind of a standard. Like we go straight for CMAs. It's how most people price properties. It's how appraisers price properties. But I'm just curious. This is just a curiosity question. Did somebody say, hey, you should do this and that's why you did it? Maybe you had a coach or a mentor. Or like what pushed you that direction where you started leveraging you know, your kind of existing data, I guess, uh, to, to back a lot of your conclusions when you're trying to negotiate for your clients? Yeah, it was my boss, um, who uh, Sean Keith, who's at my firm downtown here too. He's been in Rogers a long time, but he um, he really pushed me because I was honestly a little bit resistant to it. I think initially, um, but there's there's all kinds of um, books and literature directed specifically towards trial lawyers, and it's constantly about um, psychology and how you can use that um, in your approach to get more value for your cases and so there's a guy out there his name's david ball um, and it, he has a whole book on how to proceed with focus groups and how how to do it the right way so that it's uh, effective and valuable um, and honestly i didn't the first couple uh were kind of rough i didn't really know exactly what i was doing but once i started doing them a lot and then changing my perspective to, again, just get out of my, think more of like a broad-based, um, how am I going to negotiate with this person as a person, as opposed to two people within the industry? Because uh, I've found that really effective because you can kind of almost catch them off guard a little bit because they're not expecting you to talk about right. things a certain way or approach them a certain way. Um, and so that that has been, been really helpful, but yeah, it was definitely, um, my boss. And then just kind of within the industry, there's a real push on, you know, how, how to talk, uh, to, uh, regular folks. And the key is talk to regular folks more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Now, when we were talking, I, your eyes lit up when you were talking about, um, you know, sales bluffs, right? When, whenever you, you go out and you're negotiating and, and maybe you have a bluff or, and, and real estate agents are in these situations, I think all the time, right? Cause maybe you're bluffing. Somebody says, well, my client's going to walk or, or whatever, right? There's all types of, uh, language that people use in your opinion, uh, what makes a good bluff? Like, how do you really like build up a good offer, stand behind it? And maybe even if you have to bluff a little bit to ensure that you get the best deal for your clients. So personally, I really like to set like a, a true minimum with my client. That's an inside number that no one knows. And then based upon that, I set like a false minimum and then I just negotiate and live like that false minimum number is my final number. And all my negotiations are set up like that. And it's going to be artificially high. And the person who's like, man, this guy's a little crazy. It's a little bit too high. What is he? And then, so like, let's say my minimum number on whatever the case was 30,000. I mean, my client 30,000, that's a hard line. Just the way the numbers work out, that's what we got to get. So then I'm going to go in, you know, with a, you know, my first offer at 90 and my midpoint at 45 and any counter and anything I do, I'm going to be working at 45 so that if I happen to get 37, five, the person I'm against will think they kicked my butt, but I'm still over well above what, what I wanted as my minimum. And then your client think, you know, he's like, wow, you got me even more than, than I wanted. Uh, and so that, that to me is, um, really helpful. And the other thing that I say a lot to everyone when they're like close, uh, where I feel like, you know, I know they got a little more, but they definitely don't want to do it. And I say, look, and again, this, that false minimum helps. I say, look, man, any good deal, the best deal we can have is a deal that I hate and a deal that you hate. And he's thinking the whole time I've wanted 45,000 or whatever. And if I get Seth at 37, five, he's going to be so pissed. He has no idea. I'm giddy that I got over 30. <laughs> Right. So that, that's my main. That's a, that's a good, that's a good tactic. We never thought about that. The, the best way to win here is a, we get a deal that I hate and you hate. That's how we know that we've got a winner. That's, uh, that's unique. I've never heard that before. Yeah. If we can find that spot where, where you hate it and I hate it, uh, preferably you don't really know that I actually like it. Uh, that's the best. I feel like you can get people to move because then also on top of that, uh, they get the feeling that you're making a true effort to work with them. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the other thing is uh, I've kind of learned over the past several years is not losing momentum. Mm. You know, sometimes you can get a super hard line or you, maybe you want to, maybe they make you a good first offer and then you're like, well, let's see what they got. Fair to a certain extent, but to have kind of a, an equal response or some momentum so that there's just as a base layer, just a human element, there's a positive concept that this thing's going to get done. Uh, you know, Seth's a likable guy, you know, and then I'm getting the deals better than the other people who are, you know, being too hard line or not, you know, willing to discuss and then you know, that kind of thing. So how do you, um, how do you deal with situations where maybe you're not getting what you want at all? Like where the negotiation is just not going your way. Yeah. So that's the leverage I do have in my profession. Uh, if they're just totally off, like way off, um, that's when I file a lawsuit. Um, mm, okay, and then, but the good thing with that is I've already set the expectation with the client, you know, that they, they know that the, the people are way off. And even sometimes it's, um, you're not the person I'm dealing with sometimes is not the final decision maker. Mm -hmm. So I've had cases where they're off and I know they're off by like five or 6,000 and it's just some new, you know, person that maybe doesn't have the final say and they're trying to work their way up and they're just not going to move. And so fine. And then it's, and then I'll file a lawsuit and then, you know, a little bit later it gets resolved. Um, mm -hmm. and it's not always the case because sometimes there'll be people that for whatever reason, they just, they want to litigate no matter what. Uh, and that's fine. Cause I like doing that. So, uh, if, if they're not going to, if they're not going to be real or reasonable or approachable, uh, cause I am. So I give you every excuse uh, in the book to be, to get it done. But at the end of the day, if you're not, um, 
I'm going to take you to trial. I'm going to kick your butt. So. <laughs> That's awesome. So you used to, you would say that, you know, really maybe, you know, some of the, the best ways that you can develop just absolute confidence is in setting the right expectation with your clients. And then just knowing that you have these two guidelines basically that you can, you can stay within, you can either go super high or you can go down to your minimums, but you can't, you know, you, you have set the right expectations and that's how you kind of set yourself up to have the best success in, in a negotiation. Yeah. So, and that's key too, because it's twofold. One, you, if you do it right in the initial meeting, your client's always going to be happy. Um, and if, if, if it's an offer that they're not happy with, well, then they're mad at the other people. They're not mad at you mm. because you've set the expectation, right? So they know and they know why. The other thing, too, is, um, you know, they, the other part where we do want to have your professional input is they, they might have – the craziest baseline for what, what they think a reasonable number is or what they, you know, what is the right place to be and they don't know why. And then if you haven't set that and you get down the road, um, no matter what you do, they can be pissed at you. I mean, you could get them a great deal and they have no idea that you did it. Um, so, uh, that's, that's really, really helpful. And then it motivates the client uh, if I do have to file a lawsuit, if we've said all along our minimums, this number, and they're not even offering half, I mean, they are disrespecting you. And then that's because no one wants to file a lawsuit. I mean, I don't even want to, no one wants to. Right. So if you get to the point where you're having to, uh, you want the client motivation because they might have to buckle in for 18 months, you mm. know, yeah. take a deposition, all the stuff. So you want them motivated. So I don't know if it, how it relates to you guys, uh, your profession, but maybe it's, you know, uh, getting the client to not be afraid to walk away from something they really want if it's not the best situation for them. Yeah. I think uh, when you, when you, when you walk into situations like that as a real estate agent, I mean, if you just, if you take a lot of time getting to know your client and getting to know why they want what they want and you know, where the, you know, realistic, price point uh, maybe of the property that they're looking to buy is or that they're looking to sell is um, it, you just have that great conversation up front and don't try to under promise basically and over deliver. Uh, I think you set yourself up to have a lot of success. And when you're trying to figure out like, Hey, what's your motivation here? That will help realign you maybe even in those times when things aren't looking as good as the client would hoped uh, would have hoped or, you know, so on and so forth. And when you come across clients that just have unrealistic expectations, you have to understand as a professional, there's not a lot that you will do to change that. Like, for example, if you know a property should be priced at 250 and the client's adamant that their house is worth 300, it's better to walk away from that deal than to deal with the uh, maybe reputation sabotage that's going to come on the back end because you know going into it you're not going to be able to get them what they want they have unrealistic expectations a lot of agents don't really have that discipline i don't think in, in some ways because most of them want the commission check because they they hear three hundred thousand dollars and their mind instantly rings bang nine nine thousand dollars in commission right and then they start rationalizing well i can do it if i do this and this and this and this and this when the reality is it's just not <laughs> probably a deal that's going to work out in their favor and, uh, you know, they, they might not think about that, but that's a, that's a bunch of great points. I got one last question, man. I know you're a busy guy. I want to respect your time. Um, how do you identify opportunities inside of negotiations? So, you know, if we, if you look at a guy like, um, uh, you know, Mike Tyson, right. If you ever have heard his little like 30 second motivational reel before he walks in the ring, like he's this certain person and he's looking at somebody and he's staring him down, he's staring him down, he's staring him down. And in the motivational reel, it's like, and then all of a sudden they'll break eye contact and they'll look at the ground and I know I got him. That's why he's like, I know I won the fight before it ever even started. Right. Have do you ever yeah. come across opportunities where you, you see that chink in somebody's armor and you're like, boom, I found it. Like how, how do you identify those? Yeah, so this is a weird one, but it, it, the first thing that came to my head is to not be afraid of silence. Oh, yeah. So, yes. so like I might have someone on the phone or I may be talking to them and I'll say something and then it kind of goes silent for a bit and they're, I can tell they're thinking. And I think the human reaction is to try to fill space, especially when you're having a phone conversation. Uh, 
And so I've had awkward moments where I've, I've let people sit for like 30 seconds mm. waiting for them to talk. And then if I know they've done that, uh, I know, I mean, I just know that I'm going to win that negotiation. Um, so I, I, that's one thing for sure to not be afraid to, to let someone, you know, feel the heat for a little bit. Don't feel the urge to help them out. Um, yeah. So to speak. I love, uh, I, that's one of my favorite things because sales in a lot of cases is, is all about being uncomfortable. Uh, at least it can be for the person that you're negotiating with. And I've been in conversations, no joke, where I'm like, we're totally dead silent for two to three minutes over the phone. And <laughs> I know it's typically because we're both salespeople and we both understand that the, whoever the first person to talk is, is the one that's going to lose the business, <laughs> that's going to lose the conversation. Uh, or, yeah. or, I mean, we all win obviously, but uh, it's, it's definitely an art form to be able to sit there as uncomfortable and awkward as things can get when nobody's talking and uh, just kind of live in that moment. Cause you're right. I mean, people got to have their moment to think and their moment to rationalize and their moment to kind of come through some of the emotions that take place in the sales process and being uncomfortably silent is definitely, definitely, definitely a way to, uh, <laughs> to, to let people have that and to win in conversations. It's one of my favorite things to do. It's so awkward, but you know, at the end of the day, everybody usually ends up getting what they want, or at least you got what you want. Um, so that's awesome, man. I appreciate you uh, taking the time. I know you're busy, uh, but we got some good strategy from, from this conversation. So I really appreciate you, uh, you popping by the podcast and uh, sharing, sharing some insights today, man. Yeah, man. Anytime. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you guys, thank you so much for tuning into the Marketing Genius Podcast. Continue to listen to us on our website, rate us on iTunes and Google Play. We will see you on the next episode. Peace.